Hello and welcome to How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting a company. This is a collection of conversations with people who have all successfully started, run and even sold their own companies, sharing not only professional but personal experiences on what we should be doing now, next or never. Hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of PR consultancy for startups Fallowfield and Mason. In this episode, we hear from Lisa Song Sutton, who is a successful entrepreneur, real estate investor, former Miss Nevada United States, and former congressional candidate for Nevada's 4th District. She's also been named a global shaper by the World Economic Forum and a top 10 social entrepreneur to watch. Lisa started her business career working in a top Las Vegas law firm, specializing in business litigation. However, it was her entrepreneurial spirit that led her to create companies of her own. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for your time today. It would be great if you could start by giving us some background as to who you are and the companies that you run and also which you started first. Thank you so much for having me. Well, my first company was Sin City Cupcakes back in 2012. And that company simply started on a a bit of a whim. I was working in a law firm full time. And my co-founder with Sin City Cupcakes, her name is Danielle Cole. We had met in the modeling industry, became great friends. Fast forward, I was working in the firm in Las Vegas, and she told me she had been making these alcohol cupcakes. And I was like, that's a great idea. (laughs) And it's perfect for Vegas. This is where people come to overspend, overindulge. So you have to move here and start the company with me. I'll help you. And she did. And... I didn't even know how to bake when we first started the company. I mean, it was just one of those things where I heard a wonderful idea. We had an opportunity to start something new and exciting, and we just jumped in. And what was it you did first when you started the company together? One of the very important things that I did, I didn't quit my day job. So I think oftentimes you hear people saying, oh, you know, I quit my job and I stuck it to the man and I started my own venture. I think that's a path that people can go down and it works for some people. My role with the company was to provide that financial support, help provide business infrastructure, help provide processes. And so I kept my day job working at the firm and then my night and weekends, what was I doing? I was baking. I was running deliveries. I was helping with catering. You know, in the beginning, you wear all the hats too. And it was a really risk mitigated way for me to start a really fun company. And I did it in a way that was financially safe for me. I felt comfortable doing it and allowed us to really grow organically instead of making desperate business decisions in the beginning because we were strapped for cash. And was there a piece of advice that you were given when you started that really holds true? There's one piece of advice that actually my parents told me when I was young and it stuck with me ever since. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And I've always carried that in every venture that I've done. And it's simply the knowledge and confidence that even if you aren't the most experienced or perhaps you're not innately good at something and you see other people who are just cruising along because it seems like they are, just know that you have complete control over your work ethic. So there's a strong chance that you'll succeed as long as you can outwork other people around you. And your parents sound like very wise people. (laughs) (laughs) They are. They're amazing. Is there something that really surprised you that you learned about yourself when you became your own boss? It takes confidence and courage to strike out and try to build something that you're excited about. I'm glad that we had some wins early on because the early success that I had with Sin City Cupcakes and, and like all the fun that we had too, that gave me confidence to continue to branch out into my own ventures subsequently. So like I said, I'm really glad that I had an early positive experience with entrepreneurship because it allowed me the confidence to continue to build. And you were working in the law firm and you'd had some city cupcakes as well. When was it you broke into your second business? By mid-2013 was when I stopped working at the firm. That was about 18 months into Sin City Cupcakes. And then I started my next venture in 2014 with Liquid and Lace, which is a swimwear and women's accessories. It's e-commerce. Also started real estate venture 2014. You know, a lot of things started firing very quickly. And again, it was simply because I had gained confidence from our early wins with Sin City Cupcakes. What keeps you inspired with being an entrepreneur? 
for me, it's just staying true to my purpose and why I'm working so hard, right? So I've always had an ideal of wanting to have multiple streams of income. But at the end of the day, family is is really important to me. I come from a very close-knit family and all all the hard work and sacrifice that, that they've done to build what they have and what I was able to enjoy growing up. I certainly want to continue their legacy and, and build that for my future family. And I was reading about the fact that you are very focused on encouraging other women into entrepreneurship. Is there anything you would advise women in particular about starting a company? First off, just do it, right? Like, <laughs> I think especially as women, we talk ourselves out of so much. Um, I've seen it time and time again, um, just being an angel investor and um, hearing pitches. Oftentimes, men are so fearless. Mm. And I see women who psych themselves up and, and they talk themselves right out of it. They're like, oh, well, you know, I, I have it built. I just, it, it's in beta. We don't have enough users right now. We only have like 30 users. So they talk themselves out of it. And I'm like, no, you not only have this great idea, you've already launched it and you have users, you have a base, you have people excited about it. You have 200 followers on the company Instagram. Like this is good stuff. Tell me about that, right? And just go for it and just put your best foot yes. forward. Yes, like women, we talk ourselves out of so much. And is there anything that you have learned the hard way that you'd want to flag to a new founder? Oh, there's so many things, right? Yes, I have four operational companies right now, but I mean, I've started, what, seven? You have experiences where you hope that things are going to work out and sometimes they don't. When you have hard experiences along the way. I mean, the important thing is, is not to take things personal. You'll have business relationships dissolve. You'll have opportunities disappear. You'll have doors closed. You just have to keep pushing. And how important is trust when you're self-employed? Oh, it's everything. Not only, you know, in trusting yourself and what you can build, you have to trust your partners. You have to trust the people around you. You have to also trust your inner circle too. The people you call at 10 o'clock at night when a deal is going sideways, you have to be able to trust the people who are giving you input. And how did you find those people? It's all been organic. These are incredible people in my life who I've been able to cultivate a relationship with. I think the idea of going out seeking a mentor, I think mentorship is incredibly important, but I think sometimes people approach it the wrong way. Mentorship, just like any other relationship, it should be a friendship. There should be trust. There should be communication. For me, I've always strived to build a friendship with people important to me. And then that way it's, it's far more organic instead of this kind of transactional mentorship. Yeah. No, it's so true. And for me, the mentor I found, it's been a game changer. And is there anything, if you could go back and do it all over again, that you wouldn't do? Yeah. I mean, you know, I I try to take it as like a positive mindset. I always try to turn everything into a teachable moment. You know, if it was a bad experience, how do I not replicate that again so that I am able to move forward and learn and um, continue to to grow and be better? And not dwell on the negative either, Mm -hmm. which I think is something that British people are particularly good at. (laughs) And what do you enjoy the most about being self-employed, given that you're clearly successful in multiple sectors? Is there a real one highlight for you? I just love the the flexibility that comes with the lifestyle, right? Um, in the beginning, don't get me wrong, you are going to grind, like, and expect to grind. You know, expect to grind for several years. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's going to be tough. But you know, I think there's a saying: be willing to work for a few years the way most won't, so that you can live later the way that most don't. Oh, and yeah. I think it's so true, right? Like, you grind um, at first, but then on the back end, um, if you've built you know, residual income, if you've built different pathways uh, for revenue to be coming in um, and you've built great teams and great systems and all that stuff, then guess what? Then you should be able to scale up and scale out of the company as far as day-to-day operations. So, you know, at, at Ship Las Vegas, at our shipping stores, I don't have to go in and work the counter nine to six every day that we're open. In contrast to when we first opened, when we first opened, I was in, in there working the counter all the time. And was it good for you to actually have that hands-on experience? Yes. I think if you own a business, you have a serious responsibility to know every single thing about that business. Because guess what? There's going to be a day when one of your key staff members calls in sick and 
what, you can't jump in and work the counter at your own retail store. You should know everything about your business and be able to operate it on your own if you had to. And of course, what is it you enjoy the least about being your own boss? You know, when you're your own boss, you have to be incredibly accountable. You have to be accountable to yourself. You have to be accountable to your staff. You have to be accountable to your customers. You have to be accountable to all these different parties. Whereas When you are a W-2 employee, I would argue that you wear less hats. You have a finite job description for one, which is contained. (laughs) Correct. And you could always like point back to that. But when you are self-employed, when you're an entrepreneur, you must have self-discipline and you must have accountability. So, So if you're already not good at that now, you either better get good at that through the process or make the choice that entrepreneurship is not for you. For sure. And do you have any advice? Because obviously you have multiple different stakeholders across your different businesses. Do you have any advice for managing clients or teams, suppliers? Utilize technology. I mean, there's so many great tools that are available. So for scheduling, for example, like with my shipping stores, we use a a scheduler called Homebase. It's a great app-based tool that we utilize. It's super easy. It allows employees to check in and check out. They can request time off. For communication, um, I use Slack for our commercial kitchen as well as um, our shipping stores. With Slack, you can create kind of different sidebar conversations that are just related to scheduling or related to maintenance. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can utilize it. So just utilize the tools that are already available and and readily out there because it'll help streamline your business operations. And when it comes to pricing, obviously you've worked again in different product businesses and service businesses. Is there any advice you'd offer somebody about how to tackle their pricing? Pricing, I've found, is going to be dependent on industry. So, you know, something like a, like a retail consumer item, there's there are different formulas for, you know, if it's food, if it's, you know, swimwear, you take the base cost and, and your cost all in, you know, to get it packaged and all those things, then your retail price is a multiplier of that. Conversely, you know, in something like real estate, people are paying for service. So when it's service-based, there's a ton of different formulas depending on what you're offering. But I think what's most important is, you know, take a look at what your competition is doing. We did the same thing with with Sin City Cupcakes. When we first started the company, we looked at what were high-end bakeries selling in Las Vegas. So take a look at your competition because that's going to be one of your best barometers of how you should price. And then based on where you think you fit into the competition, you should price accordingly. Yeah, it's so important to know your competitive set. And someone once said to me, it's the shark you can't see that bites you. So it's good to have eyes out there. And given that you juggle so many things, how do you find the time? Well, one, severe time management. I certainly am a scheduler. I have to calendar things. I like to start my day early. I'll get up, you know, sometime between six and seven, just depending on what I have going on in the day. I've found having the morning to myself, getting up early and, you know, knocking out emails or taking calls or doing things that um, I want to do. I want to carve out time and make time for it. And so mornings I find are the best for me. And how do you draw boundaries around your working time and working day? Do you also have to schedule your downtime? I do in a way. I find we always make time for things that are important to us, right? And so whether it's even just scheduling time for a phone call or or knowing that, you know, hey, I'll be available from 6 p.m. onward, right? And then do it. <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. Is there any other golden piece of advice that you'd like to offer somebody starting a company? Just to encourage everyone to reach out to people, right? Like seek help and ask for advice because especially now we're all so connected. You have the potential to access almost anyone because of social media. So get in there and raise your hand and start a conversation and provide value and seek help. I think that's really important. Well, I think that's it, especially during a pandemic. Everybody's at home and everybody's sort of open and a little bit more humbled by it. And if you don't ask, you don't get. I've definitely found that in my own entrepreneurial, very short journey. (laughs) Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I'm so reassured to hear from Lisa that managing time is actually possible. She's proof that you can juggle multiple projects, while businesses no less, and still allow yourself a work-life balance. If you'd like to contact Lisa, you'll find all of her details in the show notes, along with a recap of the advice that she has so kindly shared. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. If you enjoy this podcast, I'd be so appreciative if you were to rate, review and subscribe as it will really help other people starting a company discover it. 